gently through the woods above Salisbury, with the symbolic shoots of nature pushy as ever, they undid more than they knew, more than I, the butler, knew, more than the established world was prepared to admit. Young people, young at least in mind people, can disturb so amazingly much one is forced to admire it. Oh, a little yellow daffodil. Oh, I thought you'd never speak. I wonder who dropped it in the mud like this. Hello? Anyone about? Looking for a little yellow daffodil? It doesn't matter. Hello? Please don't. They probably want to take it home to decorate their dinner table. I hate mahogany. Decorate their dinner table? Isn't that what people do? Not my people. Oh. Well, I hadn't said anything before because I didn't know how to start. Why? Well, I like to think I know things. I mean, we all do know things, don't we? We've been given knowledge. But you seem to know things that are rather far off. Like people who don't decorate their dinner table? Yes, I know. I <laughs> did have friends, you know, at college, and I have visited. It's just that... The feeling... Yes. The feeling of being... overwhelmed. I'm seeing a face I always dreamed of. <laughs> I always thought it belonged to someone whose dinner table would be decorated. Where on earth do you have dinner? It's just when you find you've gone this far towards someone and they're not... Please, can we kiss? You're lovely. Lovely and lost. Pardon? I don't know what I meant by that. Yes, you do. It was presumption. I'm terribly poised. Let's kiss. All right. No, let's not. Oh, bloody hell! We can get back to Salisbury this way. Is this because of a bloody little daffodil? Nothing so innocent, it can't disturb you. Even if you're terribly poised? Oh, we all have insecurity, Daniel. <sighs> it just gets set off by different things and different people. Like mention of dinner tables? I wish I hadn't come to Grandpa's for the weekend. I like people to be clichés. I'm hardly original. Mm, you're too original for me. Oh, someone's coming. He's trying to dodge the puddles of spring. I think the sun is blinding his glasses. Can you hear what he's saying to himself? Uh, good afternoon. What? Oh, yes, I suppose so. Oh, is something wrong? I never have a brother who's cleverer than you. Especially an older one. Goodbye. <laughs> what a peculiar thing to say. Can we kiss now? All right. Why are lips so dangerous? Why is the silken skin of mouths eating, talking, loving? Why is that the place where devastation lurks? I never knew kissing could be so complete. It's the first time. I've never felt the need to make light conversation afterwards, certainly. Well, let's do it again. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know where to put all this feeling. Honeyman? Sir Desmond? I'm in the conservatory, watering. Of course. There was a man in the kitchen this afternoon wearing glasses and a suit. My brother, sir. I hope it didn't disturb you. He's a bank manager. My butler has a brother who's a bank manager? I'm very sorry, sir. I have kept him quiet, though, up to now. Don't let him out again. Every man's entitled to climb wherever he can, but I don't want the family disturbing. I'll tell him. The status quo is what the new rich aim for, Honeyman. So if it disappears when we reach it, our lives have been totally in vain. I sympathise completely, sir. Now, you can't be rich and powerful unless there's someone to be rich and powerful over. I do appreciate comprehensively the delicate position of the rich and powerful, Sir Desmond. We need to feel safe. I know. You are fully admired and appreciated by me, 
And you can put my brother completely out of your head. Then why was he here? We always spend our holidays together, and we're talking about the summer. We're going to trace Stevenson's travels with a donkey in the Cévennes. It's in southern France. Not Stockton to Darlington? That was a different Stevenson. You make me nervous sometimes. I don't mean to. Then get the tea. And the children are coming, so mash it properly. I'll tell Mrs. Fellows. I was a grammar school boy, like poor brother Harry, fearfully intelligent and deeply in love with the life of the very, very rich, because it purchased so much culture. I mean to live with Rembrandts and sit on Heather White. However, I also felt scorn and loathing for the way huge wealth was acquired, depressing humanity in general for the benefit of the few. That is the basic immorality of life, the elementary evil. So, to satisfy my longing and to keep my conscience clear, both at the same time, I became a butler, living well and taking no responsibility for it. We all do that, don't we? And as I had long ago rejected loyalty as incompatible with clarity of thought, I also felt no duty to my master and was prepared always, when the time came, to ditch him. I might have been a very great man, Harry said. But then he was my younger brother and hated me hysterically, for which I was genuinely sad. Family tea, Mrs. Fellows. They'll be here at any moment. Our father, which art in the conservatory. Welcome to the simple pleasures, the country. We're all so locked into your daydreams, father, that we almost don't exist. How are you? Where's your husband? At the gallery. I warned you about art, Samantha. Spoils Sunday, always has done. Hello, Alfred. Father. Anything new since Friday? Just the golf. Wentworth? Moore Park. Near Watford, which isn't up to much. Make it Wentworth next week. Yes, father. And your daughter needs smacking, Samantha. She's been out ever since she came home. Home isn't here. It's with us in London. She's got her own flat. Yes. Then she ought to have a husband. I don't like the way the young make mock of what we all aspire to. Get her settled, Sam. Family-like. Yes? We'll see. We will. Now, tea. Next week you'll come for lunch. Um... It'll be no trouble to us, will it, honeyman? It'll be a great pleasure, as it isn't. What else could you say, Honeyman? It's the truth. You're not paid to tell the truth, Honeyman. Just the credible. And remember, you two, if it weren't for me, you'd have grown up in the north, in the back streets of Stockport. So you needn't look gloomy at the thought of Sunday lunch. We lived all week in Holland Park and only came to Salisbury at the weekend. I loved driving the Daimler. Low, unshakable. And I always had the use of it for myself which made Harry wild. You don't know anything about life, Tom Honeyman. I know immense things, Harry. The sheer silk of driving this black dart through London teaches me more about life than all your days struggling up the ladder at your bank. Struggle teaches you everything that matters. Oh, I know about struggle. I watch television. He's given you that as well. You've never even had to buy a license. Nor a meal, Harry. You and I are about to feast once again on the diner's card he pays for, and you're going to adore it, aren't you? Oh, God, I'm weak, and the food will be so lovely. Stick with me. Sir Desmond's family are, as always, in my hands, giving me my pleasure. What would we do without you, Honeyman? Very little, Mr. Alfred. Part of the family, Honeyman. And its secrets, Miss Sam. Run me a bath. Run me a bath. If it weren't for me, oh, if it weren't for me, that's what I thought then. The truth is, Harry, do you have to slurp your soup? I'm a bachelor. Well, so am I, but I don't offend myself by doing that. The truth is, I'm no different from anyone else, superficially. 
I serve wealth, like we all do. And I take my pleasures where I can. But, and here's the real truth, very soon I can and will change everything by one simple... Oh, for heaven's sake! I wish you'd been a great man and left me alone. You'd miss our lovely holidays. Not me. You would. Take someone else. I want you. To treat like dirt. You're a highly intelligent manager of a bank in the West End of London. That's not dirt. It's a rarity on lots of counts. You always make my job sound like a joke. Try to learn about jokes, will you? And try to get hold of some views so we can tussle brilliantly over our back end. I hate Matisse. Is that a joke or a view? You see, dirt. By views, I mean ideals. You must have some somewhere. Convictions, passions. We passed the 11 plus to be purged of those. I don't know how you did it, but you still seem to have convictions and passions and all sorts of things that should have been balanced out of you at school. No, school. We were exhorted there to be honest and to be loyal to mutually incompatible ideals. <laughs> we weren't purged, Harry. We were simply placed in an impossible position which turned into a trauma. Oh, God. The city's full of men who've been shocked into immobility by having to be honest and yet never to reveal the duplicity of their friends. <laughs> they look glazed and grin a lot and talk without inflection. They can't live creative lives at all because they're caught by the balls by English middle-class morality, the searing, almost castrating stiff upper lip, ready to engage its teeth unless they swear to believe in honesty and loyalty at the same time, which, of course, they can't. <laughs> well, I've thrown off loyalty. The truth is, Harry, the truth about me, the real truth, is that I am in a position to unravel so much wealth, so much dishonestly acquired money, that I could make the world an infinitely happier place tomorrow, and one day soon I will. How? Well, you see... I could kill Sir Desmond Lyle, couldn't I? No, for God's sake. Well, why not? Human life is sacred. To whom? It doesn't matter whom to. It's a useful phrase to stop us killing people we don't like. Are you showing loyalty to the human race? Yes. <laughs> How humdrum. How typically colourless. I hate you! Sibling rivalry. And you're not to visit Salisbury again. Sir Desmond says, I was very nearly part of the family. Even in my little flat, my eerie at the top of the Holland Park home, with my television window to the world outside, even there, the family visited me. Part of their lives. Miss Paula. Do sit down. I, uh... You've got a new television. Your grandfather provides me always. Did you choose it? Oh, that would have been too much. I'm simply grateful for all the generosity. Gratitude is dangerously near servitude, don't you think? I am a servant. Part of the family. I came to you because there was no one in, and I wanted to tell someone I was happy. I'm honoured that oh, you... Oh, for sh God's sake, how starchy can you be? What made you happy? I can't tell the butler, can I? He's just a servant. Love? In the woods above Salisbury. Oh, Honeyman, I'm happy for the first time in my life. That's the rainforest you're watching. Miss Paula, you must have been happy before this. No. What a pity they have to chop it down. Still, we can't have everything. Miss Paula? It's no use. I can't talk to you. We're miles and miles apart. There was, to be frank, an awful lot of triviality. The curly crockery, the embossed silver. Rich men so frequently get lost in luxury, and then the shapes of things get blurred, and the sharpness of life is blunted. He had so many art treasures. I swooned daily over his impressionists. Yet it was the chintz 
that took up all my time, straightening it, dusting it, preparing it as the scenery for his game of happy families. Honeyman! Mr. Alfred? I have to speak to you. Come down off that ladder. Your father can't abide the possibility of cobwebs in the pelmets, Mr. Alfred. It reminds him of Stockport. Shouldn't you be at the office? I'm at a business lunch. And I'm not coming to Salisbury next weekend. I'm going to France. La petite maison secondaire in Normandy. I have to guard my property and see that it's all right. He set his heart on everyone. You, Miss Sam, Miss Paula. Sunday lunch. Tell him it's an investment. I'll do my best. What would we do without you? I wondered even then, was I almost too good at butling? Drawing baths, for instance. <laughs> I loved drawing baths. I'm drawing the bath, Miss Samantha, in your old room. No need to mention this to Father Hanneman. Uh, very well. Oh, you keep the rooms exactly as they were. He likes to feel his home is solid and secure. To keep away the memory of Stockport. <laughs> Have you ever been to Stockport? I'm happy to say not, though I know it well from his bath time lectures. <laughs> <laughs> Unzip me, will you? Me? There's no need to be afraid, Tom. You're practically a member of the family. And being wealthy, we're not that sort of family, are we? No. Besides? Oh, besides. Besides. Miss Sam? Things happen to one. One accidentally looks through a new window and the view's wildly different. Don't you want to know why I'm here at four in the afternoon? Well, it's hardly my place to ask that. Please. I'm here because my husband... He does have a name. You must try to remember it. Alistair. Alistair is at home this afternoon cataloguing things. And I can't meet him smelling of another man. I see. And I don't think I can make lunch on Sunday, Hanuman. Oh, dear. You'd better go now, I suppose. Oh, you've seen me often enough in my knickers as a child. And out of them. Oh, good heavens. <laughs> a dressing gown. You prude. She wasn't beautiful, but there are things a butler shouldn't see and shouldn't be seen to see. Like all the family, she was immensely sensual and largely unaware of it. Paula was the same, the most sensual of all of them, drawing you to her without meaning to Daniel, I don't know if I'm into this yet. So? People seem to do it all over the place. Like Uncle Alfred's golf. That's confusing. It isn't known I'm here, either. By whom? I don't know why I said that. What do you do here in London? Geology. I work at Oh, the... yes, of course. I forgot. Hmm. What do you do? Oh, the plan is for me to become an architect's assistant, which I am, and then an architect. Whose plan? Mine. Yes, mine. Not your grandfather's? <laughs> they laugh at him where I work. They call him the dread developer. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone ever laughed at your relatives? Oh, isn't that what people do? Not my people. We've had this conversation once. I haven't come for that. What have you come for? Well, actually, I feel foolish. And I haven't come for that either. I don't think it's my fault. I'd better go away again and do some drawings I'm supposed to work on. Why? Daniel, I, I'm a grown-up girl with a job. I'm not supposed to be here. Supposed? By whom? You do pry, don't you? We met over Saturday sherry in Wiltshire, kissed in the spring woods, and felt very much part of each other. What lies behind all this? Haven't you come to find out? You said I could call whenever I liked. Was that all? Isn't it enough? Are you always like this? There you go again, prying. Oh, for heaven's sake. Well, have you Vinnie Mozart? I'll see. I know I'm disappointing. But that's what I am. I'm a disappointment. Who to? Well... People float towards me and and float away again. I watch it happen. 
I meant more cheerful Mozart than this. I haven't any. I'm in love with you. You don't know who I am. I'm finished. The end of something. No, don't ask. Do not ask what I am the end of. Wouldn't you like to know about me? No. Well, I do know about you. And the way you move and things. Well, how people smell. How they invite you to inquire. How they put you aside. That comes so quickly. But you have to use words too. And your words are different from the way you smell. I'm a nice girl. I was brought up in Salisbury, so I too have suffered niceness. I'm very straightforward, very interested in what I do, which is research into the platelets of the Earth's crust. My father, a solicitor, is very fond of me, as is my mother, and I'm fond of them, though we don't share a single view, I think. We rarely talk about it. My sister's married to a lecturer in art in Newcastle with a family, and she's very nice, very contributive, very happy when we meet, because we like each other. And I'm happy about that. It's nice. Mm. Nicer even than being friends. But uh, I don't know what it is. Or even if I ought to try to find out, because uh, I'd have to pick away at things we've only said to each other once and maybe thought of long ago. And underneath there are questions that are very uh, tender. You've touched those questions. And uh, I'm not what I was at midday last Saturday when I parked my car in the drive of the Lansing Thompson's large house and walked in for sherry. Something universal has reared up and stared at me. You're prepared to talk about all this? I have to. Is that what people do? I do. And you laugh at your relations? Mm, I'd hit them otherwise. I'm going to kiss you now. All right. It might be a bit unkempt this time. All right. And then perhaps you'll talk? Can I stay with you in Salisbury this weekend and make love in the woods? Hmm. Mm -hmm. mm. The green dressing gown, Honeyman. Green eases the spirit after a busy day. Sir. And now, a bath. Oh, I love that bath. Don't we all? I never thought of you feeling things. Don't go. Sir. Oh. Ah. Ah, that's marvellous. Ah. I'd like to be able to say we kept coal in ours in Stockport, but that'd be too colourful. Stockport was stale. The grey, stale life of keeping body and soul together. And the great, grieving Stockport railway viaduct across the valley. I can never quite see the valley. Oh, uh... The word valley makes it sound like Switzerland, that's why. But Stockport was a mud pie of trolley tracks and cobblestones and greasy black sludge. <laughs> it was as if a huge slug had crawled across the banks of the river and stopped, coughed and died. The whole ugly mess as far as Hazel Grove, stinking of smoke and grime. And bloody hell, the Germans missed it in the war, would you believe it? It's all still there. Cleaner in some places, drabber in others, but still rotting, dead but endlessly suppurating, and bits of green grass fighting through and withering around Davenport, and motorways skirting round it, derelict buildings in Moth Side. Oh, funny man. A bath here, in Holland Park. With fitted carpets and massive curtains, old masters on the heavy wallpaper. I tell you, it's a great fortress against the slug. And the gardens in Salisbury, 
flowery cushioned ramparts against the oozing north of England. You don't know the terror lurking in the woods, Tockport, and Crewe, and Berry, and those awful seeping Lowry paintings. And Buxton. The Buxton moors were covered in sooty sheep like bodies from Belson. The Pink District had all the sort of glossop falling on it. You know, black heather till you got to Chatsworth. Chatsworth? No. Oh, old Chatsworth was a sudden waft of Versailles. And I can't think how the Duke lives so near the enemy. Sheffield pushing over the hill. Derby dragged to the south. I couldn't do it. I'd be frightened to death. I truly believe you are braver than you think, sir. Fear makes you do brave things, certainly. I made money because I was afraid. Money keeps me safe. It gives me... home. Your brother and no. I don't think he considers money in that way. Oh, for me, money's the power that keeps Stockport at bay. And on Sunday, I shall have my family about me. For lunch in the country. That honeymoon is achievement. A big house in the southern counties and all my family about me. It's a pity Lady Lillian won't be. She used to interrupt. You can go now. I should have killed him then and there with the word family on his lips. He would have been happy. I would have been happy. As it was, there was that cocky little lover of Samantha's at one of those functions in the art gallery. <laughs> Darling, we can't meet in Alistair's gallery. We aren't meeting. We're bumping into one another. Which one's Alistair? The one with the pleasant face and the half-smile, nodding slowly to the serious man in the Italian jacket, and then nodding fast at the end of each sentence as he laughs nervously. <laughs> seems nice. Yes, he does seem nice. Why have you come? To look. I can't stay long. The mail train goes at four, and I have to film my parcel, leaving the depot. Well, can't someone else? Then we could... Look, I have to be there myself if I'm to prove it gets interrupted. I just came to get a glimpse of you in your habitat and to ask if everything's fixed for Sunday. <laughs> Alistair will go to Father's in his car mm. and I'll say I'm picking up Paula from somewhere remote in mine while well, she'll go up by train as usual. This isn't just an affair, Sam. You won't be going back. We'll kill the ghosts in Salisbury Wood and then run off together. I might be frightened to begin with. A life in dreams... I haven't worn jeans for years. You worked in television once? I was passing time then. Why are you talking into your catalogues? Paula, darling. I need to see you. Who's this? His name is Sean. He makes investigative television. And this is Paula, my only child. Oh. Can't you go back to work or something? Yes, I can. Goodbye, Sam. So nice to bump into you. <laughs> And what is it? I won't be coming on Sunday. What? I might not see you again for ages, actually. I'm not running away, but I'm rather sick of you. You're 24, Paula. You should have done this at 16. Better late than never. Goodbye. Paula! Hello, Sam. Hello, Paula. <laughs> Alistair, Paula's leaving us. Uh, oh, goodbye, Paula. Goodbye, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? A man, I should think. It's time for one. Uh, yes. <laughs> is it? Oh, God, Alistair, you really are the dullest man in art. You make me sicker than Brother Alfred, which is saying something. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Alfred makes me sick. <laughs> Goodbye, Alistair. <laughs> pa pa Paula's got a flat of her own, so she's left us already. Have I missed something? Sam... Could I have sensed a need to act sooner? Perhaps quite differently from how I did? I put away so many things I didn't want to know. That Sunday, 
He still expected them for lunch after church in the cathedral because I hadn't managed to tell him otherwise. I didn't believe otherwise. Speculation that the Chancellor may have to raise interest rates even further brought outspoken comment in today's papers. They pointed out that the increase in home ownership is already causing an underlying strain on disposable income and that any increase in mortgages is likely not only to curb the current spending boom but to increase wage inflation, thus putting a further break on domestic industrial growth already under pressure from the growth of import penetration. The family, of course, is the center of all Christian imagery. And the image of the father bears the central weight of that great metaphor. As we all sit together around our family dinner tables today, we should recall that we are part of one of the greatest and weightiest poems of social and religious significance. For the family, is the seat of all that is good and right in human life. Just as this great building, with its mighty spire, is the center of all that is good and right in the wider context. So where the bloody hell are they? Mr. Alistair will be here very soon. Oh, full of sparks. But Mr. Alfred had to attend to his capital investment in France. French letters, Morlach. Miss Sam has been called away. She's got a lover. I've had the correspondence interrupted, but there's nothing I can do. And Miss Paula... An only child, and spoiled. I told Samantha, you must have two like I did, but she's stubborn. Well, I said a family bloody lunch, and I meant a family bloody lunch! Your geraniums. This morning's sermon bore on this. The family, the great poem. The begonias. And God the Father. Oh, which of my children would hang themselves on a cross at my command? I'm sure they're totally devoted. To I've them. made this family safe. And all I've got to show for it is a half-wit owner of an art gallery full of cubes and splodges and chairs covered in milk bottle chops. They'd lock him up in Stockport. Oh, you love the Cinerarias. I painted them for you. Why didn't you tell me all this earlier? You had the pleasure of anticipation. And the pain of disappointment. Well, I'm sorry. So you should be. I couldn't stop them. Why not? It's not my place. Place? Place? Can't you take any responsibility? That's very wounding. I run your home beautifully, and you know it. Yes. And today, you'll dine with us to make up for the others. Me? You're part of the family. Paid not to let me down. But I'd be out of place. You'll be out of place if you don't do what I say. Sacked without a reference. Get the soup. Sacked? It went to my heart like an arrow, confusing me with panic. And I'd never known panic in my life. I can't help it, Mrs. Fellows. I must eat with him, he says, or else be sacked. I know you like my conversation of a Sunday, but there's nothing to be done. I'll take the soup and uh, come back for the joint. Why was I so frightened of being sacked? Had I accepted my position as a parasite more completely than I thought? Had I yielded my independence? Was I truly part of the family? Oh, Tom Honeyman... You were an arrogant fool. And up above Salisbury in the woods, there was more life happening than you could control. Oh, oh. oh. oh it is your face. Oh. Ever since I was at boarding school and had my first crush, <laughs> it was a face like yours. Am I just a fantasy? Not yet. So far, you're still real. Your stomach is extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be if it were windy. Mm. Stomachs look like tripe when they're cold. Well, sunshine, drying hours, 
Mm. Mm. Oh, you're kind, aren't you? Mm. I've known others and they weren't kind at all. It's a thing for two people, Paula. It's not just a man and a donut. <laughs> <laughs> In a way, it does very much concern oneself. Mm. One's very own self, which another person is allowed to know and stuff. Oh. I should be having lunch with a family at Grandpa's. Your parents don't seem to mind what you do. We've established a way of living between us. Grandpa has a butler for establishing ways of living with us. <laughs> he calls us uh. Miss Samantha, <laughs> Miss Paula, Mr. Alfred. <laughs> a sort of parrot. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? Two other people prancing about without their... Cl Good heavens, it's your mother! Picking daffodils for her table? Not exactly. Pull something on and don't look. I don't know, should I? I choose this wood for killing ghosts. Your father's been interfering with the public mail for years, and I have to exorcise my anger over that by making love to you above his house. You've made your film about him. Oh, I love you. I love you, I love you. Mr. Mitch, I've got things to say. And things to do. I've often done things with my clothes off, but hardly ever said things. Oh. Now then, I've been waiting for you ever since Paula left school. Before, really. Since she was at boarding school, and I've been bored ever since I packed her off. Are we doing this simply out of boredom? Boredom is a formative experience like any other. It makes its mark by sealing you in. Denying you existence, forbidding any expression of yourself, withering your feelers into life. And the longer it goes on, the more you shrink and you squeeze out stuff. Little excuses, little jobs, little illnesses, little, little... which thicken the boundaries between you and life. Your thinking limbs shorten and shrivel. So you begin to need the bandages of little doings as protection against the world where once you were. It's a barrier of dozens of little voluntary committees. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the ones I sat on were for. And if you show any life at all, it is a trapped wasp, a buzzfly, whirring round charity shows and fancy dress balls. <laughs> oh, the humming sessions I went to about Shakespeare with well-known actors. The entertaining drone nights I rigged up for Alistair's artists. And no one would have noticed if I'd stopped. Mummified by triviality. They won't now. No one will miss the tiny tic-tac of my life. The frantic round of buzzing scratchings, always elegant and pointless. Mm -hmm. I thought that to want somebody like you, all-consuming... Oh, no, that was immoral, extravagant, whorish. <laughs> but it turns out that I was waiting for just that, for you to smash my life open. How did I do that, exactly? You showed me the thrill of the chase. You took me into the editing room on that tour of the BBC <laughs> I'd organised for some squeaking ladies like myself, and mm. just... Shifted my whole perspective, like giving me new glasses. I wanted to be behind the camera where you'd been, hunting the men, or my father's men in this case. I wanted to nail those awful people with you, take those prying shots, ask those impermissible questions, feel the unforgivable passion. <laughs> then there you were as hell, offering it to me. Uh, you worked in TV before. I'll fix it if you really want. <laughs> <laughs> and you did. And we made love with such excitement. Mm. Finding out about each other and not caring for a second that my clothes were underneath and getting crumpled. And I was certain then that the whole of me was twice as big and then 20 times as big as it had been before. And what about you? You said, this has to be it, at the end of the <laughs> editing session. And I couldn't wait to be with you from then on. I also wanted to do this. This love mm. 
as near your father's prison house as possible to kill that monstrous connection. I thought of St. George. Oh, how delicious. Mm -hmm. <gasps> Someone else is over there. Give me that shirt. Uh, Mother! Oh, my God! Paula! My pants! I thought you'd left home. What are you doing? Oh, same as you, by the look of it, and I hope you manage it at my age. Oh, hello, uh... Daniel. Yes, of course. Yeah. My name's Samantha. This is Sean. And every time we meet in future, we'll know what's underneath, won't we? Where's Daddy? Do we need him, too? He's having lunch with your grandfather. As the only loyal member of the family. Do you do this often? No. You? No. That makes us both innocent as little lambs and learning fast. <laughs> I'm surprised at you, Mummy. I had to say that. Did you, dear? To get everything straight, I must tell you that I'm leaving your father. What'll he do? It'll be some time before he notices. Oh, the weather, please. It's too good to talk about Alistair. He is important. I know. I hate the thought of what I'm doing to him. But I never let go of what I want. Sean works in investigative television, Daniel. Oh. I used to do that. And now I'm going back to it. To work. I didn't think you knew about work. Sometimes you're very like your father. Too wrapped up in yourself to notice anyone else. I'm here, Mother, precisely to unwrap myself, which I am doing. Notice, like mad. I live in Earl's Court and do geology. Oh. In Earl's Court? Mm. Where you'll be going, I suppose, Paula. I take it we're all moving into other people's flats and things. <laughs> Why? That's awfully definite. Sensible and economical for you, surely. The mortgage rates going up. Oh, not that we want to talk about mortgage rates. Frolicked as we are in the bare skin. Like your grandfather, really, mortgage rates. They dictate so much of what you do in a dull. Uh, will you share our picnic? Oh, yes, please. Clothes will only gather crumbs, so don't bother to dress. Are you really leaving home, Mummy? That is precisely what I'm leaving. Which home? My father's. His endless rearrangement of other people's lives. Alistair's just a room in my father's house. It'll be terrible for Daddy. No, it won't. The house is in his name, so he'll potter on quite happily. You're very hard on him, Sam. You didn't have to marry him. Having done so, I had to live with him for 25 boring years. Hmm, it would have been our silver wedding in a month. Celebrated with dust-collecting rubbish from Harrods and cast-off paintings from Alistair's artists. Oh, I've investigated all there is to know about Alistair, and I could make a documentary of insufferable niceness about him. So I know that now he'll be as happy as can be without the guilty feeling that he ought to be original. Like so much else, he spins away below me and out of sight. That's brutal. Yes. Duck down, everyone. It's the man in glasses again. What man? On the track there. He was here last week. Down, go on, down. <laughs> He's laughing. I don't call that laughter. I feel immensely uncomfortable. Oh, I feel adolescent. Isn't it wonderful how life turns up all the time? For some people. It was Brother Harry. Harry had called again, in spite of my telling him not to. I came on him in the kitchen with his glasses off, wiping the laughter from his eyes as I went down for the joint, and I was cold with fury. Over the years, I had learned how to go cold in the face of strong emotion. Actually, of course, I would have liked to be able to laugh with him. The joint, Mrs. Fellow. <laughs> Dining with the knobs today, are you? You'll be responsible and loyal very soon. I'm dining with Sir Desmond because he said he'd fire me if I didn't. Loyalty doesn't come into it. <laughs> well, loyalty is very close to fear, I'd say. Or love. Do you feel that for Desmond Lyle? <laughs> is that why you're planning Mrs. how to... Fellows <laughs> isn't interested in reports of my light-hearted banter with you, Harry. <laughs> Have you been drinking? I'm laughing at your eating upstairs. Sir Desmond <laughs> says you're not to visit. Why have you come? To annoy you. You'd better go. You'll get your knuckles wrapped by Desmond the Dreadful if you don't. Why aren't you married? <laughs> because you frightened all my girls away. <laughs> Hurry along, honeyman. <laughs> It was true. I took a wretched pleasure in humiliating him before women. 
It was almost a relief that in leaving him alone with Mrs. Fellows, I couldn't indulge that most unsatisfying pastime. I always wanted to humiliate Alfred, too, in front of his endless girls. But he never had any who would have noticed. As I walked to the dining room, I imagined him in France with another giggling tart. Upper class, lower class, always tarts. The joint, Sir Desmond. I've been ten minutes on my own with Alistair. <laughs> I don't think I'm quite on his wavelength. <laughs> I've been telling him his house is in his name. I don't quite understand. You see, I know perfectly... I've never trusted my own children to be sensible. So, his house is in his name. I was right in that. <laughs> you're always telling us you're right. <laughs> and uh, am I always right, Honeyman? Yes. Oh, yes, you are. I sometimes wish you weren't, but you are, Sir Desmond. Loyal servant. <laughs> Part of the family. Better than the rest of them. Pass him this plate, Alistair. What? Uh, <coughs> oh. I'm going to screw them, Tom and Eman. They can't escape all this. Escape? Samantha's gone, Paul has gone, Alfred's going, you're a fool. Oh, I'm sure Sam's just on some committee. And you can't marry and hope the cash will fall into your lap with no more effort than a wedding night. Oh. It takes a life to do what I've done. And I'm not going to see my money lost to those who won't work to keep it together. Eh, hey, honey man? I know exactly how you must feel. So... I'm taking steps to see that doesn't happen. The slug isn't going to get it. What slug? Stockport. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, well, when I'm dead and you're all sitting around this table mourning my passing, now, eat. Ah. <clears throat> Your brother's got some food, I suppose, Tom? I told him to stay away. Oh. I like stubbornness. Part of the family, too, your brother. No. He uh, manages a bank, Alistair. Hmm? Uh, who does? Oh, get your beef in you and keep quiet. <laughs> Is this premature senility, Honeyman? Oh, please. I'm just the butler. What did he mean? A new will that would stop his children escaping from his influence and business enterprises and so prevent me from unravelling his wealth as I'd always said I'd meant to. I had to act, or the money would never move away into the world, as it should. It hammered me. I must remove that monolithic figure so that everything would crumble. No successor could master the details of it all as he had. No one could make his decisions. That was why, at his age, he was still chairman. And it was why... Oh, God! It was why I did, indeed, love him. Oh, the anguish of that loving. And, as it turned out, the ignorance. Mr. Honeyman? Sir Desmond Lyon. I know your brother... <laughs> and, of course, you know my kitchen in Salisbury. <clears throat> well, I, I have visited you. I don't want to know any more.
And I don't want you to say you've seen me. Uh, of course, Desmond. Uh, though my brother has a terrible way with him when he wants to know things. <laughs> and so have I. Now, bank managers make wills, and I want you to make one none of my own lawyers know about. Here's the draft. Draw it up by the end of the week. Yes, yes, indeed. I'll sign it on Friday. Better take care of myself till then, eh? <laughs> <laughs> You're a more spineless man than I thought, honey man. You'd better correct that. And clean your glasses. Once I'd made my mind up, I was happy, confident, perfectly at ease. There's a certain saintliness in sacrificing a loved one, especially when it is so obviously done for the good of mankind. It even helped me to handle Alistair with a graceful optimism that cheered us both. She's gone for good, Honeyman. Gone to work in television. That's not for good, Mr. Alistair, whatever else it is. Once they're into television, they never move. The escritoire needs polishing. Excuse me. So, that's that. <laughs> Over. She'll soon be back, full of fresh perspectives and piercing insights, and you'll start life with a new sense of urgency, and your gallery will sparkle as a centre of excellence you can hardly dream of at the moment. Do you care about art? I paint miniatures, rural subjects mainly. Oh. Did Sam ever talk to you at all? Just once. She called me Tom and took her clothes off. Good heavens. Oh, for a bath. Oh. And she gave me powerfully to understand your life is getting a new injection of vitality. Oh. Be happy, Mr. Alistair. For you, life is on the up and up. For Desmond, though, the down and down. The poor, dear man. Put my dressing gown ready. The white toweling, I think. There we are. Why especially the white? It'll set you up for dinner very perkily, the white. The brightness is all before your fellows at a Lord Mayor's function. I'm not going to the mansion house in my dressing gown. But you do look nice in it. And if you look nice now, you'll feel nice for the rest of the evening. Is the bath ready? Oh, yes. I think so. You're very chirpy all of a sudden. Thank you. I never thought of you as having moods. Servants aren't supposed to have them. We have our moments. Well, chirp on. It's nice. White towels, white soap, white face flannel, white bath. And the heat, the exact confirmatory temperature to make you feel comforted, yet adult. You really care about me, don't you? I do. Ready? Thank you. Oh! I love the simple pleasures. <laughs> the kneeling down, getting the thighs and things used to the warmth and wet, and the sitting. Oh, oh, oh. Ah. Ah. And bliss, the lying back. Oh, oh, oh. Even the poor know this pleasure, honey man. Do they really? Look at bloody poor. They have no fear of falling. So they say. What's that? It's a very large, very powerful electric element from the hot water system of an expensive suite in an hotel I once worked in as a lad. Claridges, in fact. Is it plugged in? Yes. <laughs> what are you going to do with it? I'm going to put it in the bath. Like this. <laughs> Not a mark on him. Such a simple pleasure for both of us. He warm in his bath, I warm in the sanctity of acting for mankind. Sir Desmond Lyle, chairman of the Stockport and Eccles Building Society and of Allied Southampton Construction. 
Sir Desmond, a man of considerable influence in the City of London since 1979, was also a great collector of 19th century Impressionist painting and was said to have the finest collection of Odilon Rodin's outside Paris. He was, of all the rich, the most generous with his wealth, and of all the powerful, the least puffed up with worldly pride. His contributions to the arts, including the building of the dance center in Havant, and the Museum of Modern Art at Avebury earned him international fame as a great patron we should all be eternally grateful to. He was a very healthy man. I think he was murdered, Alfred. Who by? Who cares? Oughtn't we to find out? He wasted all our time when living, so I'm spending no more on him now he's dead. When are you coming home, Sam? I'm not, Alistair. Honeyman says you are. Honeyman is wrong. Harry? Oh, go away. I've come about... I know what you've come about. I can't talk through a glass screen, so let's go to your office. Leave me alone. I want to forget you. I've only come to say that I've got the tickets for the holiday, but now... I'm not coming. Why ever not? Because you're a murderer. Uh, don't be hysterical, Harry. There's a queue out here. You can't deny it, can you? I can and do. But it looks as if I might be able to take my holidays earlier. You so... said you were going to do it. Harry, I'm not discussing this through a glass letterbox. In fact, I'm not discussing it at all. I could have you arrested now. But you're too loyal to your big brother to consider that. Aren't you? Die! Caught, you see. Loyalty versus honesty. Muddled by your own impossible ethic like all the middle classes. Now, if we could go in June instead of August. You cocked it up, you know. Pardon? I told him I wouldn't say. But now he's dead. His personal fortune's going to the children, provided they both remain directors of his companies for the rest of their lives. But he was going to make a new will, divesting them of all their power and money, leaving his fortune to the Tate Gallery. It's an immense sum. And diverting the income from the shares they would have had as directors to the National Theatre. And he was putting you in charge of it all at a salary of £60,000 per annum. No. But you killed him before he signed. <laughs> now everything's locked up exactly as you didn't want it to be. But now he's gone. It'll all collapse, surely. Oh, Tom, you don't understand a thing about the world, do you? There are dozens, hundreds of directors to run the companies. But if he'd signed the new will... Now go away. I was stunned. He'd meant his fortress to exclude his children and to include only me. Me to preserve his money and his reputation as a benefactor of the arts. Me. Instead of which, well, they could, of course, renounce their directorships to gain their freedom, but somehow I doubted if they would. And in any case, the money hadn't been released into the community, so I had changed nothing. And my younger brother had been taken into Sir Desmond's confidence, which made me mad. But undaunted, absolutely undaunted, your bath, Mr. Alfred. Thank you, Honeyman. It was a very decent funeral for a very difficult old bugger. He'll be missed. Eh? Who by? The shareholders. They won't notice. Take my tie. Sir? He's built the business up so big, it's mostly run from the Maldive Islands or Buenos Aires or wherever the money sloshes most.
my gang, huh? I've put out the fight. Good. So, though the shareholders or savers or whatever they might have thought they were investing in the Stockport and Eccles Building Society run by our dear old dad, they were, in fact, contributing to a satellite TV channel using NASA's military technology and taking security photos, supported by several South African banks and controlling four supermarket chains and half the world's agrochemical businesses, chopping down the rainforests and doing naughties in the Thames, let alone the telephone companies and the uranium mines, etc., etc. Your plain old family man with a Stockport and Eccles mortgage doesn't think about that. Thank God. And now Sir Desmond's dead? Well, oh, just go on and on, controlling the status quo from no one quite knows where. I say, am I getting a paunch? Pardon? Don't want to get so fat I don't meet the girls where it matters. <laughs> Ready? Thank you, Hanneman. Oh, oh, such a simple pleasure. Even the poor know it, they say. Oh, bugger the poor. What's that, Hanneman? It's a very large heating element from Claridge's, Mr. Alfred. Would you just move your legs? Thank you. Ah! This would... That is ecstasy. The ecstasy of the jealous is enormous. If I'd had one more drop of talent in my veins, I would have overcome the lethargy I knew at heart I suffered from. I might have been standing there and singing with full throat, rendering the music of the great creators with unstoppable majesty, sending waves of beauty into that ancient, perfect house. My pleasure in such sounds, always so vast because of that fantasy, was deeply tainted with hideous despair. If only, oh, if only, I'd been someone else. <laughs> Miss Sam? Tom! Aren't you getting wet? It was a beautiful service, and I'm always transported by the sung mass. Did you kill Father and Alfred? I am the butler, and you know what they say about butlers. <laughs> so, did you? I'm going away, you know. I'm not taking up the directorship. Alistair can do that if he wants. What do you do for a job now? I had assumed somehow that you would... I don't know. Oh, nobody has butlers these days. They're very old-fashioned affairs. We still serve the rich. Do you? Anyway, goodbye. My lover's waiting for me in the car park. You're not going back renewed and refreshed to Mr. Alistair? It would kill him. Oh, and don't you do that, Tom. Off you run. Old-fashioned. Old-fashioned executioner of a modern monster that wouldn't, couldn't die. Grown too big to be a simple fortress against Stockport and become instead a threat to all mankind. Oh, dear, how small I was. Honeyman, what are you doing sitting amid all this screaming, blinding colour? Should I not? I didn't realise you liked art. I have a small interest. Picasso is very big, of course. And all these genitalia. Green ones. Red. Yellow. Doesn't it turn you on? Even at the basic level of... Uh, you know. You just think it's an old man drawing dirty pictures. Well, I'm a geologist and I think it's wonderful. I don't suppose we'll meet again, Honeyman. You look absolutely awful. Sitting there like a cross between a vulture and a refugee. I, I can't bear it. Paula. Well, it's true. He's like a retired headmistress who used to be frightening. Those servants are always frightening, though. Giving their lives to others like virgin sacrifices. 
It's consenting rape. I am a man of passion. I love justice. I'm giving my life for humanity. Good heavens, Honeyman. Do you have feelings? Enormous ones. Only I painted smaller stuff. The end was obvious. Alistair was there to see it. Mr. Alistair? Is there any news of Sam? She's left for good. Oh. <laughs> Didn't you meet her lover at Alfred's funeral? He's a virile man in tight corduroys, whose eye is sharp and whose expression is the lively blank of one who assimilates everything. Your daughter, Paula, is in love and is rejecting those she grew up with, especially me. Is there a drink? No. What? May I introduce you to my younger brother, Harold? Oh, the bank manager. <laughs> I'm not a joke. The cynical gentleman over there is an inspector from Scotland Yard who has come to arrest me for the murder of Sir Desmond and Mr. Alfred. Really? So the house is yours, and you'll have to get your own drinks. Sir Desmond's last words to me were that I should try to get some spine. I've done that. It was me who called in the police. Ha! You call that spine, you loyal little creep. You couldn't get a spine into your back with major surgery, let alone with moral exhortation. You have the life and spirit of a dead condom. Take him away! But who was I to talk who was old-fashioned? The Empire, born from Sir Desmond's simple fear of Stockport, grows and grows and floats about the globe, gobbling the ozone layer, killing Indians, putting up inflation, swallowing people's savings, evicting people who can't pay their mortgages, that sort of thing. It sheds compound interest on those who bow to it and withers the hopes of many who know nothing about it. Some other way than mine is needed to be rid of it. I misread things, you see. The children, they seem to know more than I did, after all. The women, whom I thought of as prisoners, they weren't prisoners at all. They were like some beneficial dry rot, working away inside their family to destroy it and transform it. They didn't think what they were doing, they just rotted their part of it away. I still don't quite understand about being out of date. It's such a patronizing criticism. One can hardly bring oneself to believe it. Quite often I don't. But oh, I don't know. I don't know. The monster cannot be allowed to become the master, can it? In A Butler Did It by David Cregan, Bernard Hepton played the part of Honeyman, Anna Massey was Samantha, and Hugh Manning, Sir Desmond Lyle. Paula was played by Melanie Nicholson, Daniel, Simon Treves, Harry, Roger Hammond.